was a different trip. It was the moment when I needed people around me. Some other impulses, new challenges. So I picked up the phone, called my friend who's the mountain guide, and after a few weeks, I was here. Mountains have always fascinated me, but I'm not the walker type. On foot, landscapes change too slowly. I've always liked the variability outside the car window, hence the passion for overlanding. But this time, I wanted to slow down, experience deeper, feel the mountains with every inch of my body, leave everyday life behind my back and just face something new. Therefore, when I found out that it was planned to climb Slovenia's highest peak, Triglav, I was eager to take up this challenge, and I joined the group from Explore PL. It was the beginning of October, but instead of autumn colors, we were welcomed by snow on the trail. And the first approach to the highest peak of Julian Alps turned out to be the winter one. I've never had crampons on my legs before. I've never got up at 4 a.m. before to find myself on the trail at 5.30 a.m. And painstakingly climb another six hours, climbing two kilometers up. I never had to wonder how to dress in case of such high temperatures fluctuations and conditions that change so suddenly with only a 30 liter backpack on my disposal. And here I immediately fell into the middle of the weather boiler and on the first day I understood what such a trip entails. But, as they say, to dare is to do. That's why I immersed myself in this experience with my whole being. We set off from our base in Hranjska Gura around 4.30. Heading east, towards Jesenice. After reaching Moistrana, we turned south onto road 907 and from there we took the trail leading to the Prilesi parking lot, as far as you can reach by car. From there, all we had to do was hike. Initially, the trail leads through the forest. Starting around 5.30 am, we covered the first kilometers in complete darkness. We tried to take a 10-minute break for every hour of walking. Around 7 it started to clear up. We reached the first larger clearing and we had about 4.5 kilometers of walking behind us and 615 meters of elevation. Here we made our first stop a little longer and from there we started the arduous climb up a much steeper path. And here snow began to appear on our trail. next two hours is only 3 kilometers, but again almost 500 meters of elevation. Due to the weather conditions, it took us a little longer than planned, but the views compensated for this fatigue, and it is hardly possible to say that I was taking a long time. <laughs> After another two hours, during which our legs were sinking in the snow, the gusty wind tried to blow us off the trail. The snow sometimes hit us straight in our eyes. We covered another 1700 meters and reached the height of 2290 meters. Hence, we had only 168 meters of elevation and only 650 meters to the Dom Planika Bratkutlan mountain hut at an altitude of 2385 meters. The increasingly deterioration weather, piercing cold and lack of visibility made us doubt whether an attack on the summit was possible. We arrived at the hut around 11.30. It was closed, but we heard there was someone inside, so we knocked. An older man opened the door. Can we warm ourselves inside for a while? We asked. No, you can't, he answered, and closed the door. Admittedly, we were a bit shocked. We did not expect such a response, especially in such conditions outside. But we had little to say. After consulting our guide, we decided to come back. 
Trigla has to wait. Not the most pleasant feeling after 6 hours of walking over 1700 meters of elevation and almost 9 kilometers of the trail. And here you still have to come back. And Triglo actually waited until October 16th. Exactly 5 days later we decided to try again. This time the most persistent 4 of our team. Wake up again at 4am and again the earliest uphill, this time a shorter but steeper climb. We had a good pace and we were already at the Planica hut at 9.30. We took a long break here. Time for a snack, hot tea, flying a drone, a few photos. And finally around 10.20 we went on the trail. After another 650 meters and 150 meters of elevation we got here. which took us about 45 minutes. The next 220 meters takes almost 50 minutes. And finally, after passing Mali Tree Club and walking along a very narrow ridge, we reached Tree Club wrapped in clouds around 1 pm. There was nothing to see around. I tried to ascend the drone to see if I could see above the clouds, but the moisture in the air immediately froze on the blades and the drone lost load, which meant it was constantly entering landing mode. It only managed to record a short shot of us on the summit and the Mavic was useless under those conditions. We spent almost an hour on the top and around 2 pm we started the descent. At a mere 2863 meters, Triglav might seem like an alpine pimple, but be warned, this is a serious lump of rock and home to several of Europe's most incredible walks. It is said all routes require at least two days for normal mortals, but, as we have proved, it's doable in one day also. Beside the Kruma route that we partially did, rising up to the Kraderica hut at 2515 meters, there are also other routes possible. The most demanding ascent is called the Bomber and requires nerves of steel on the iron cables. Head for the top of the Vrata Valley. Ahead stands Triglav's legendary north face, a near vertical kilometer of karstic limestone. Bamberg itself takes you through a series of tough vertical pitches, narrow canyons and plenty of exposure, popping out on a rocky plateau leading to Planica Hut for a possible overnight before the final ascent. The Prague route to Crederica Hut is easier than the Bamberg, but still requires steady hands up some vertical sections. All were protected as long as you can use the Via Ferrata correctly. It's used also for descending as it's the easiest one among the other Via Ferratas on the wall. Trigla is a very dry place, except during summer thunderstorms, so bring lots of water.
If you never dealt with iron roads, as via ferratas are literally called, then I definitely recommend this form of mountain tourism. It is a way to experience the mountains previously reserved only for experienced mountain climbers. A way to get to places where the average tourist does not reach. Just like an off-road vehicle, it allows you to reach places inaccessible to the average motorhome. Overlanding with an off-road vehicle is something completely different than overlanding with a motorhome. It is exactly the same in this case. It is an off-road on food. That's probably why it got me so much. It was completely new to me, but I fell in love with this form of activity. It's a rope park for adults, although younger ones can try this form of mountain experience with a great deal of caution as well. Which, of course, also applies to all daredevils. For some, it will be an activity that causes sweating of the hands and shivers of the back. Others will feel like fish in the water. I highly recommend that you start your adventure under the guidance of an experienced person or relatively easy routes marked as A and B. If you feel comfortable on easy sections, you will be ready for much more difficult challenges. Huge adrenaline rush guaranteed, as well as unforgettable views. The Ferrata Guide application makes it easy to find potential places. It is a base of several hundred ferratas throughout Europe and its immediate vicinity. With the gradual enlargement of the screen, more and more places where ferratas are located appear. Mainly Austrian ferratas reign here, but in neighboring countries such as Switzerland or Italy, we can also find a lot of them. Just like in Slovenia, where we had been. When choosing a particular ferrata, we have given its detailed data in the form of GPS coordinates, access routes, information about the degree of difficulty, weather prevailing there at a given moment, and very often, but not always, a topographic map of a given iron road. In this way, at home, we can see what awaits us by choosing a given attraction. Photos and ratings, along with opinions posted by tourists, additionally facilitate the decision whether we want to visit this place. In the case of the exemplar German Ferrata, which was the most demanding of the ones we climbed, the route is perfectly illustrated on the topographic map divided into individual sections with different levels of difficulty. What was it like in reality, and was it worth it? See for yourself.